Awesome. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, welcome back from lunch. It's a good time to talk about all this uh, food stuff. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm at Hoodbot. If you want to uh, at me later, uh, stills are okay on my slides and everything, so feel free to do whatever there. I'm filming fine. Cool. All right. So we went over all of this, which I usually go over myself. Awesome. I don't have to do it. It's a long list. Yay. Um, but I have to give this additional uh, content warning for my bio slide <laughs> because I've, I've given this talk once before at a OS Fields in Seattle last year. Um, I'm not local to there. I'm not local to here. I'm used to having to travel to bigger cities to give talks like this. Um, and I was used to saying the city where I was from to an audience who usually had never heard of it. Um, but a lot has uh, changed in the past week. So I'm Christine. I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, I was born there. Uh, I live there. I work downtown about a few blocks from where everything happened that you might have heard about in the news recently. Um, but yeah, I, it's been a long week. So uh, bear with me. I do uh, JavaScript web applications at a company there. And that's hard enough as it is, you know, JavaScript. <laughs> um, so now that that's all out of the way, I'm reiterating. I'm a web applications developer with an undergraduate psychology minor. That's it. Um, from Hans University, by the way. Yay, women's single sex education. Um, but I'm making sure we're all clear that I'm not, that I'm not qualified to give medical or therapeutic advice with anything I'm saying in here. So uh, take, it what, take it as best you can. All right. So, <laughs> whew, all right. So what is body positivity even? Um, I'm talking about pizza, I'm talking about standing desks and body image, and not just body image, but body positivity. Like, what does that even mean? Um, in figuring out how to approach this piece, which I wanted to, I wanted to have such this big, gigantic scope for it, um, I owe a lot to a talk I saw at Cascadia Fest in 2015 by Ashley Williams called If You Want to Learn ES6 from Scratch, You Must First Invent the Universe. Um, so what does a JavaScript talk have to do with body image, right? Like, that's kind of weird. The title of her talk is a reference to a quote by Carl Sagan. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. So I suppose for my talk, we'll go with a pizza pie, because why not? So the point is that our apples, or in this case, our tomatoes, or whatever you want to go for it, there. Um, the building blocks of this thing that we're supposed to be creating right now, they go back a long ways through many steps of cultivation, growth, intention, and accident. So oversimplifying a whole lot, her talk was about programming abstractions from a teaching perspective. We create abstractions of bigger, more complicated concepts, and we use those abstractions to match patterns. When we teach beginners, we need to be careful about which abstractions we collectively use, because ultimately those match patterns have consequences. Sometimes the way our abstractions were developed makes it extremely hard to figure out even what purpose they originally served. And for beginners, and for us as teachers, it can be tricky. So if I want to talk to you about body positivity, and we're being really generous and you know, figuring out that I could maybe, uh, I have to invent a universe where the way that we talk about bodies makes some kind of sense. And when I first gave this talk, I guesstimated that I could do it in about 20 minutes. Typical dev. <laughs> 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 so in the, the research field of artificial intelligence, there's a concept of an embodied agent. And with that, summarizing that, it means that the AI interface is given a body or a face and it uses that to communicate non-verbally alongside methods like text or voice. Sometimes that means a physical robot. Sometimes it means a virtual representation of a body or a face. There we go. OK, so eye contact and gestures and uh, body posture. These embodied agents, they turn towards a thing to show they're interested in it. They, they nod to show they're listening to you. Um, these embodied agents convey meaning in ways that just other kinds of AI cannot with words alone. So the people who write the bots and who make AI also have bodies. 
you and I have bodies? What meanings do our bodies convey? And what control do we have over those messages that they're conveying? Instead of being maintained by code, our bodies are maintained by food. Food also conveys meaning. Where we live and what we believe. What resources we have available, who we've met, and what jobs we have. Eight necessities successful companies provide in their break rooms. 3,288 slices, the Baltimore tech community's growth measured in pizza. <laughs> Headlines like these, like we and our coworkers and our peers and our bosses, we see and we share those articles about tech culture. Staying on top of trends, whether it's like Facebook's messenger bots or like what Airbnb serves, Airbnb serves their employees for lunch, it can impact our careers and our businesses and our tech communities. From the free, for the high cost of free office snacks, technology companies are famous for providing free food for their employees. Office areas stocked with snacks are great for morale and promote random interactions that often generate new ideas. The problem is that free food, if it's the wrong kind, is not really free. It can kill you, or at least make you fat and unhealthy. In the opening of this article, ideas are generated by snacks, the snacks can kill you, and tech employees are somehow kind of involved. Unclear. <laughs> um, but not those employees, but you, the reader, you specifically are implicated in this. And if your body is fat, the meaning that your body is conveying is sickness and death. We're told that our culture is sick, that our culture is obesogenic. We're told that there's a crisis, that fatness is a health epidemic, a literal disease. And diseases are scary. But you might remember what I was saying before all the technical difficulties about the dangers of abstractions because we've been talking about this stuff for a long time. We have a lot of legacy code here. Uh, this is a quote from William Banting who did a really popular diet method in 1863. That's how long. We've got a lot of stuff to cover here. So the snacks are killing us. The pizza is poison. The gluten in the pizza might be poison. The sugar in the tomato sauce is definitely poison. There's a whole documentary about it, right? Um, Preservatives are poison. Also, your desk chair is poison. Um, fatness is the oncoming storm. And if you do not strap on your Fitbit right now, then you only have yourself to blame. We parse these messages in various ways. Uh, Soylent, CrossFit, treadmill desks, salads, Whole30, CSA subscriptions, paleo, YOLO, strong filters, and stronger beers. <laughs> in my case. <laughs> but when all is said and done, no matter what we do with that information in our own lives, we are being encouraged to pattern match a non-fat body as a healthy body. And to see that healthy body as being of higher value in our workplaces, not just at home. Companies sponsoring health in, uh, endeavors like Fitbits or um, exercise programs or doing specific foods that makes you a better employee, they say, but ultimately it makes you of more value. This startup will disrupt your company's lame free pizza day. The farther we go with this rhetoric, the more ableist it risks becoming. Because who gets to participate in health? talking to people who have read articles or anecdotes about teams who do planks or push-ups to keep their meetings short. You might hear a few comments about that, like, you know, that's, you know, really out there and weird, so, you know, the things that we're doing in the office like that are, you know, we're way less extreme. But what kind of bodies can use a standing desk or participate in a walking meeting? And why do we assume that certain foods are healthy for all bodies when one person's health food can be someone else's tr trigger for a symptom flare-up. I just lost my hand. Um, yeah, but uh, more importantly, whose who's food is healthy? 
Um, we have all these cultural assumptions around which foods are good and bad, but whose culture? Where does the food have to come from? And how much does it have to cost to be healthy? What foods don't make the cut? And who are we willing to displace to make the world that we think we want? So bodies are central in the oppression of people. There is so much material stemming from the earliest days of nutritional studies that we've abstracted away from their origins. But white supremacy is still fully present in the way that we talk about bodies and food. I didn't really give myself enough time to even scratch the surface in this talk um, of the ways that we oppress people using tools like food and exercise. If you want to take a deeper historical dive, I've included a few uh, references that I think are really good. I'll be publishing these slides later on Twitter, so I definitely recommend them. But everyday actions can build a universe that we don't want. And I'm talking about all this systemic stuff, and I'm supposed to be giving you something that's actually actionable so we don't all go home very sad. Um, so we're going to talk about fat talk real quick, and I'm going to try to breeze through this. Uh, this is from a study by Arroyo and Harwood, and it's categorizing and giving examples of this fat talk concept that we're talking about. It includes what one's eating and exercise habits should be, like, I know I need to work out more, I should watch what I eat, fears of becoming out of shape or overweight, how one's eating and exercise habits compare to others. Amber works out twice as long as I do. I wish I had her stamina so that I could lose weight. Or other people's shape and appearance. Like, look how much weight he's gained. He looks terrible. Or when you're talking about Trump. Sorry to be real there, but it's true. Um, or one's own shape, later diet. Or supplements, real meal replacements or muscle building strategies. Um, like, I haven't talked to the researchers, but I'm pretty sure like wearables and Soylent would fall into this category. But fat talk is interpersonal, too. It's, it's a way that we test people's perceptions, that we get reassurance, we get confirmation of suspicions, we evaluate socially upward trajectories towards that body of higher value. It can be a means of absolution, and sometimes it's a way to get control of saying something bad about yourself before someone else says it about you be a way that we test what scares us. Psychological safety, it's a real thing. But the problem is that fat talk is not unidirectional, like redux or flow. It's a t there's a tendency in much of social science to understand causality as a unidirectional process, in part fed by the focus on experiments as the best test of causality. However, many causal relationships are bidirectional and mutually reinforcing. Fat talk is mutually reinforcing. There's practically a set script to how we talk about fat and bodies. When someone says, I wish I was thinner, you're supposed to say, oh yeah, me too. Or like, no, you look great. There's a social contract of engagement that goes around these conversations. And we feel pressured to engage, even if we don't really care. Even if we feel perfect, we feel pressured to continue that reinforcing conversation. Fat talk also, they found it mediates our abstractions and patterns. It's what exists between weight thoughts and mental health concerns, between chronic dieting and the possibility of an eating disorder, a good day or a bad one. Fat talk, whether it's reinforced or shut down, negotiates the way forward for vulnerable populations, even when you aren't the one initiating it. So who's assumed to be vulnerable even? Because when we talk about eating disorders, those vulnerable populations are often assumed to be women, and usually white women, and usually those with the means to seek treatment in the first place. Research demographics and tech diversity measures <laughs> unfortunately rarely deviate from that expectation. The everyday assumption about eating disorders is that we're also talking about anorexia or bulimia. But binge eating can affect our worst places too. Um, especially in a workplace culture that waxes on about 10x and flow, employers don't seem to recognize how much binge eating or other eating disorders can affect our work productivity. And binge eating also affects all genders, because if you're thinking that eating disorders are a low priority, because tech has you know, so few women, it's time to think again. Tech's overly full of men, but those men are also at risk or already have eating disorders. And it's really negligent for us not to talk about that. And yes, I said all genders, not both, 
because eating disorder research often neglects the health and wellness needs of trans and non-binary people. So I'm coming up here with like facts and research to give you stuff, but all our research is a big old pile of gender binaries and science is made up of science who are you know, not very good at educating themselves about these issues. Uh, so what to do about fat talk? <laughs> Can you not? <laughs> If you regularly do a lot of fat talk and you find yourself doing it, the thing is you don't have to love your body, your workout, your food choices to make a difference. You just have to pause that conversation, starting with yourself. So instead of doing another Whole30 and getting three days through it, try a no, no fat talk 30, or just like a week, a week of no fat talk. Also consider the implications of body positive phrases because bodies are not a fixed point or source of perfect truth. And not all phrases are positive for all bodies. For example, phrases that often includes trans people are, your body is already perfect. All bodies are good bodies. Don't change your body, change your perspective. There's nothing wrong with your body, there's something wrong with society. Sometimes bodies are problematic for us and sometimes bodies have to change and that's okay. It's also okay to fully disengage. It's going to sound awkward if you're not used to it, but when someone says fat talk with you and starts trying to do that conversation like, oh, I definitely you know, shouldn't have had that brownie today, you can just leave them hanging. Like the next time someone complains or about or justifies their food choice to you, change the subject. Ask about their dog or their kid or ask what they've been working on. You don't have to love your body to be valued. You are never obligated to love anything, including your body. Emphasize care and agency over perfection. Some counterexamples are all bodies have value. All bodies deserve care. And don't let society tell you that your body makes you less than. Employers, don't penalize or reward food choices or body decisions. Be flexible. If you're an employer or a manager, the people who work for you don't owe you their health, but you owe them theirs, and that includes mental health. Don't penalize or reward food choices, desk choices. If you offer a variety of snacks, offer a variety of snacks, not just the ones that you call healthy. And if you do meetups, like, keep doing pizza, but, you know, make it acceptable for other people to disengage from that narrative, for people to bring their own food, even try doing a potluck, because you never know. It could work. Embodiment is hard, and it's harder for some bodies than for others, but I want you to know that you are all amazing people, and thank you for bearing through with my technical difficulties, which were very awkward. But, yeah, I want us to you know, feel good about ourselves right now and get out there. You know, maybe eat some snacks later or maybe don't. And let's focus on those random interactions. Generate new ideas, us, not the snacks. And yeah, maybe we'll catch a spider later. Yeah, why not? Thank you.